Oh my God, no. I got scared. I got scared for a minute. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> What's going on? Welcome to another episode of Lounge with Legends, episode 28. Right? You got me on that one, Marty. I tell you, every time it's something different. That one there threw me for a loop, but I appreciate that. I literally created that this morning. That was like, I've been creating videos over here for clients, and I decided, you know what? Let's make one for Joint Task Force 214. So uh, that's a uh, great job, Marty. Yeah. Good job. No, no, nothing scarier than not having a plan for a first quarter. So we're opening up our uh, our coaching for a Q4 kickstart for uh, Q1, and we're accepting clients now. And if you're interested, go to our Joint Task Force 214 Facebook page and DM us the word LEAD, L-E-A-D, and we'll be in touch with you and get you on a good rate. If so you're not planning you now, out? you're in trouble. What's that, brother? If you're not planning for January now, you it's almost too late. You need to get on it now. I know. You should. You got Christmas coming up. You need your email, nurturing, sales campaign, all sorts of stuff. But what's going on with you, buddy? Oh, uh, just the same old, same old. But, you know, you know, I, you know, I can't let this day go by. This is a big day for us, you know, besides having our first ally, Jonathan Bowman Perks, on the show. Uncle Roy's this here. is a special day. And just for that occasion, I brought something to the party. Oh, geez. So today is Marty's birthday. Okay. The Moac is actually celebrating his 35th birthday, right? <laughs> right. Yes. So anyway, I got you this because I can't be there. So I got you this to, to do this. Whoa. Oh, happy birthday, happy birthday. nice! Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. Oh my goodness! I'm just glad you didn't pop. You didn't pop out of a cake or something, because that would have been truly horrific. Well, you know that's coming. You know that that's for behind the scenes. You know we did our. That's that's not me coming out of the cake, of course. I, I would, I would, we would do something better than that for you. But, you know, happy birthday, Moak. This is a Thank great you. episode. Today's Marty's birthday, in all seriousness. Uh, I appreciate what you are doing. And uh, I'm sure that everyone is going to be blowing up the social media feed, wishing you a happy birthday. Uh, I appreciate it, brother. And I appreciate Team Feltz always with the support, outpouring of support from Uncle Roy and Nick. And for our sponsors, we have sponsors now. Uh, so we put the link out there. We've got um, uh, Joe Nolan, Captain America. Thank you, sir, for being a sponsor. And to you, Mom, for being a sponsor of our show. You and Dad have put it, uh, so much work in there. We appreciate that. Uh, so we have our Patron um, Patreon uh, page is, is live. And we are doing a whole bunch of different giveaways for our, our sponsors. We have, uh, I designed, speci specifically designed, uh, stickers, coffee cups, um, a what a, a hoodie, and a tote bag for so you don't have to use nasty plastic bags and you destroy the environment, especially after last week's guest Kyle Hansen. Come on, you can't use those plastic bags. Anymore. I tell you what, after Kyle's episode, my uh, LinkedIn uh, messaging DM direct messaging to me has blown up, That's asking good. how they can support Kyle out there in California. That's amazing. It's a good thing. Uh, so many awesome things we've got. We've got uh, coming up pretty quick. The have the humble alpha veteran empowerment event is coming up with uh, Stephen Eugene Kuhn and Lane Ballone. Also, friends of uh, our guest today, our legend today, Jonathan Bowman Parks, uh, which is how we were introduced through Stephen Kuhn and his gracious uh, introduction. So uh, go out there. The uh, the uh, tickets are still for sale. It's in Houston. It's a uh, the seventh is the veteran empowerment, the, uh, and the pitch contest. We'll find out the finalist. And if you guys are following, we were on, um, street shares and they did that with Mark Rockefeller and those guys and Donnell John. So a lot of crazy events. And then we also, we were on PodFest. We were just submitted that should go live here in a bit. So, and then of course you and I are going to be there, there joint test. We are routine and lounge with legends is going to be in Houston the first weekend in November. Yep, we'll be there and we will be coaching, uh, providing um, our support to our fellow veteran entrepreneurs, helping them clarify their message to increase their reach and communicate with their uh, their avatar. So it is, it's going to be great. And then the weekend after that, we obviously got triple nickel for his birthday. So a whole yeah. bunch of stuff coming up these next few weeks. Giddy up, tighten that chin strap and let's go. All right. So why don't you introduce our guest today. I think you should introduce him. You've actually been on his show already. 
All right. So, so Jonathan is uh, John Bowman Parks. He's he's uh, our first ally. It's, it's amazing. I, and I'm I couldn't be more honored in, to have a five eye partner come in. It's it's so cool to have that, especially after everything I did. My background, those of you know me, uh, is a lot of time working with our allies in Army Africa, Army Europe, and the Middle East. And so the brotherhood, the 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 uh, the bonds that we have. And one of the things that I used to say when we had these large scale exercises, like 27,000 people in 16 countries, is that um, countries do not form partnerships and bonds. It's the people that do. And so when when the people come together and they work together towards that common goal, that's what really brings it together. And that's why I'm so excited to bring in Jonathan as our first. And uh, and when you hear about his background, you learn from him. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I was, I was honored that he asked me to be on his podcast, uh, Inspired Leadership. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. And James, I think he even, you're going to be on there, are you not? I am. I think he, we led in with the heavy guns. We brought the MOAC in. His All episode's right. going to be on the 15th of November, and then I'm going to come in uh, on the 27th of, uh, actually, the uh, December, right? Actually, right. the 27th of December. I'm going to bring him on, but we're going to run out of time. So let's Okay, get let's him bring him on. on. Okay, here we go. Hey guys! Here we go. Greetings to my allies. How are you both? <laughs> Love it, brother. Love it. Welcome. Thank you, Welcome, sir. Um, I, I mean, we are truly honored to have you on the show. It's uh, yeah, we've been giddy about this. This is such an awesome to have you here. So thank you. And what time is it where you're at right now? Is it like yeah? So it's now uh, five o'clock. But I just yeah. want to say I love the intro. I just like didn't want to stop. I thought it was so good. I like I was in a computer game. It was so good. Really <laughs> professional. One of the best I've seen ever. It's really good. Well done. Uh, thank you. We have a lot of fun creating our own videos. So these are all done in house. So ah, uh, so cool. <laughs> you got the job. You got the job. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So um, so tell us a bit about yourself. Um, just a little bit of a background and, and what you do. What do you do? Yeah, would you like me to go back to my days in the military? Would that be first? Yeah, we'll there? do that. Let's talk about your, your what was your call to serve? We'll start there. Yeah, my call to serve. So um, I suppose I was two and a half years old when um, the, the memory I have is hiding behind the skirts of my mum as uh, there was a knock on the caravan door. We were living in a caravan on the edge of a, a runway in Scotland. Um, because we couldn't afford a house in those days. My mum and dad got married too young. He was a fast jet pilot in the fleet air arm. And the man standing at the door was wearing a hat like my father's. And this is my father's hat. There we oh, are. It sweet. fits exactly. Now, I wasn't in the fleet air arm. I was an army officer. Yes. But um, the man who was at the door, sadly, he was the casualty visiting officer. And his job was to say, look, ma'am, I'm sorry to tell you, that your husband's been killed flying in Singapore, in Changi. And he died saving a couple of the men there. And he died a hero. And it, it wasn't made up. It was actually the truth. That wasn't just some sweet words to tr try and cover up something wow. difficult. It was actually true. Wow. And um, so, so really, I was always interested in um, magazines about heroes and people mm -hmm. charging into battle, Captain Commando, all this kind of stuff. And... Always wanted to be an officer. Uh, it was something I always aspired to do because my father had been an officer. Right. And my uncle had been, and he'd also been killed. And my grandfather served with the war office as an inventor, and he'd also been killed. So three of the family had been killed flying while working with the forces. And so I felt this, the, the call to serve. But uh, I was a little bit slow, a bit thick uh, growing up, as told by my teacher, you were thick and you're going to become a dustman. Because I couldn't spell, I couldn't do my maths. It turned out I was dyslexic, but they didn't know in those days. I'm 60 now, but, you know, in those days they just went, you're thick. And, uh, okay, I'm thick, you know. And um, But, uh, yeah, I went through uh, at the Army Sixth Form College, went to the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, uh, where I was an officer cadet. And certainly that was the making of me. Uh, I got onto the cadet government became you know, an, an officer cadet, uh, cadet corporal, which was a big right. thing for me. I never had anything like that. And then went in for, for 10 years into the Royal Signals, 
uh, telecoms. I was uh, a spy in electronic warfare, listening to the Russians and the East Germans, working back to GCHQ. Um, I think you have your similar service, and we worked very closely with the Americans as well. We did joint exercises, electronic warfare exercises with our American troops on the border, and where we'd have direction fighting, and they would too. Um, and, I, and I had a great service for 10 years in the signals, and then I really loved the the tough end, the sharp end of the spear with the infantry. So I went to one of the infantry units. I, after I'd been an instructor back at Sandhurst, um, I, I, I um, having had outstanding reports, I got an average report at Sandhurst and I thought, mm, I, I don't do average. And so this is when I reached out to find more about the man I never knew, my dad. And, and I got letters from all over the world from guys who'd served with him, who told me about it. And one of the guys said, he said, Jonathan, he saved... Richard's life, he, he flew his plane oh, wow. to te test it and it killed him rather than kill Richard. And I was his co-pilot and like in Top Gun, he got me out, but like Goose in Top Gun, he was killed when his seat mm -hmm. sent him into the tailpiece. And wow. so you can be a victim, poor me, or you could choose to try and find inspiring men and women like your father and your mother right. and learn from them and pass it on to other people, which is why I'm with you, Marty and James, today. Wow. wow. That, yeah. Dang. That beats James story. He just didn't want yeah. to go in the Air Force. <laughs> yeah. That, that was, that was pretty, uh, I couldn't even imagine just thinking about, cause unfortunately I've been on the, the end where you're actually notifying the family members of that situation. I, that just powerful. Those are one of those things that always stick with you. I couldn't even imagine being on that end yeah. of that uh, conversation. Wow. It, it just changed our lives forever, but um, what is interesting is my mother believed in me, even though the teacher thought I was the thicky. And she said, no, you're going to be good with people and, you know, we'll find a way. So I just had to work a lot harder than others. Mm. Um, you know, and, and after some of my early jobs, I say electronic warfare, I worked in brigade headquarters. I really enjoyed that. And I was very good at running. My thing was running. I still hold the world record for a double mountain marathon, a, a really crazy thing to do in Cyprus up this 6,000 foot mountain with packs and team of three. And teams come from all over the world to take part in it. And um, but that was quite different from how I began out when I wasn't very sporty. The army helped me get that fitness and the orienteering and the navigation. And uh, particularly in the infantry, I had a great time because I also did training with the airborne, with the with the, with the paras. And I got my sort of maroon berry and my my parachute wings uh, doing the, the jumps, which I was frightened as we were discussing, James and Marty. I was frightened of heights, but I did it as a dare. And someone bet me when I was drunk. I bet you couldn't do airborne. I went, yes, I could do it. Oh, God, this is a picture from your airborne days. Yeah. And the guys who are blacked out, they went into the special forces. So that's why we uh, we covered over their faces. So you don't know who they are. But yeah, I can still remember those instructors. And uh, I remember one of the guys used to say, sir, what's your village doing for an idiot when you're here? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sergeant. You know, and, <laughs> And they always loved beasting the officers more than the men. Men, you can have a rest. Officers, go and run round the hill. Another four <laughs> circuits. And yes. uh, uh, it, was, it was a good time. But, yeah, I had a great time there with uh, doing that. I also was lucky. I went to Bosnia. Uh, I don't know if you got a picture of me with my warrior fighting vehicles. I but I had a, a company of uh, the armoured infantry, uh, which was very good, just after the Dayton Peace Accord. Uh, there, there we are. That's me in the turret there with my goggles on. I always loved the sort of the old Rommel goggles. Yes. And, and uh, that was over. Oh, I read your book. <laughs> That's right. I read your book. I read your book. I know what you're going to do. That was Patton, wasn't it? I loved him. And um, yeah, so that was us on patrol in, in Bosnia. And I remember having an interesting time when we had to try and keep the peace. And I had a patch the sort of size of half of Texas. I had to look after it. It was massive. And um, this Serbian general, two of his guys rushed out. And they decided with their Kalashnikovs to take on my store corporal who had glasses as thick as milk bottles and his assistant who was scared of guns. And, and they were in their Land Rover and they stopped them on the road like this. They go, oh, like this. And just then a Challenger 62 ton tank just traversed around the corner, just happened to be coming on this road. <laughs> Nothing for miles. And these guys thought, oh, my God. The Brits could call on tanks immediately. We do it. And they ran away, left the Kalashnikovs on the road. So I had to um, I had to go visit the Serbian general. So I took three of these warriors down there and I parked them out of sight with my sergeant major. And I walked up with my pistol on my holster, my berry on, just, just like that, with my interpreter. 
And I said to the guy on the gate, I said, I want to see the general. And the guy went, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, in Serb Croat. And I said, um, no, I need to see the general. He said, he's not here. And I went and clipped my fingers. And one of my warriors came up to the front gate and his barrel was pointing at him. He went, oh, my God. He reeled. I'm like, oh, general. Is here. He said, the, the general's coming in 10 minutes. I said, no, no, I need to see the general now. Two more warriors come to the front gate. He goes, the general appeared. And it was a bit of showmanship. It was quite fun. Right. But we then talked about the guys who'd done this. And I said, uh, we, we chat about everything other than yeah. the issue. We talked about, you know, the Sarajevo skiing and everything else other than what the guy's done. And at the very end, after I drank four glasses of slip of it, I couldn't see. And in fact, his plant pot, I've been pouring a couple of them in his plant pot. because I would have been completely shit-faced. But anyway, so I, we finished that and I go, and of course, you make sure your men are in the jail when I come back next time. Yes, Major, no problem, he said. And so I set off. And then the Sergeant Major poured me into bed at the end because I was completely out of it. And, and he said to me, but what would have happened if the general had said no? I said, I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> <laughs> Call on American air power. But I think about the American connection, which was, was dear to me. My father trained uh, when, it, when he, you know, he became a pilot. He trained in Pensacola in Texas. Okay. And that's how he met my mother. And they met and they had their great romance on Padre Island down nice. in Texas. That's, uh, yeah. And I went there with my mother to see our American relations out there. Um, when I was at the Army Staff College, we went to Fort Leavenworth and nice. we worked with the, uh, the Fort Leavenworth Staff College team. That was great fun. I met all my American colleagues in Germany and in Bosnia, of course. Uh, and when I worked for the assistant to the head of the army, you got a picture of me looking like a complete good geek in with all the regalia as an ADC I, to the I head of the do. army. I uh, did. That, that, that was quite a fun one. So when I was working as his bag carrier to the head of the army, we, we met General Freddie Franks, who was a legend uh, and a really good uh, American commander. And of course, my um, there we are, me, me being the ADC to the general. Um now Field Marshal the Lord Inge. I think he's he's probably a bit later on. I think I'm not quite as young looking as that, but uh, <laughs> I, I try my best. But um, I don't see the difference. It looks exactly the same. <laughs> you guys, I'll definitely have you on my program next time as well. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the person I really loved was uh, General Colin Powell, who sadly oh, yeah. Yeah. has passed away. And he was next door neighbours with my father-in-law, uh, who was a brigadier in the Royal Engineers. So quite a special connection with America and um, the, you know, the Brits and the Americans, that special alliance, which some people try and destroy. But I, I always go back to Churchill and, and his love of being part American and the love of the special relationship. So yeah, had, had a, had a ball of a time, 20 years in the military and um, went to the staff college, did my MBA while I was in, because I think it was the sort of thinking about transition really guys from, from the military to business. I, um, I looked around when I was the ADC to the chief of the general staff, which is like the, I don't know, um, head of the army. Right. Um, what's the equivalent in the American army? What do you call them? The uh, um, army chiefs of staff? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, when I was working for him, I went and sat in their board meeting and I thought, do I want to be one of them? No. Am I good enough to be one of them? No. Oh, it's great to see Steve there. Stephen, <laughs> Stephen was the one who got us in touch. Good man. Um, and, and is this army for really for me? And I thought, probably not. I think 20, 20 years, got my MBA, which was a good preparation for life out of it. And, and I, I, I didn't get promoted to Lieutenant Colonel on the first occasion, even though I'd come out in the top 10% or the second or the third. And it's only years later I look back and someone had, had killed me off in my career with, oh, I question his judgment. Probably right. I mean, my judgment might have been absolutely awful, but I never had been told that. But that line is like death. You know, yeah. you're not. I would have become a lieutenant colonel, a colonel eventually, but way after the rest of my guys who who are now generals and retired. But it was it was a great life, and I learned so much, which serves me well now. Right. Uh, that's that's huge, and it's it's funny how uh, um, an evaluation report fit report, you know, efficiency report, whatever you call them in your different services out there, like one line can just destroy you. And if it's a person who doesn't know what they're writing. No, and I, I, mean, did, I didn't even know the guy. I'd not met him. 
I'm going to use but, myself but he, as an example. When I was a second lieutenant, here I am a second John. And um, who was your boss then? Uh, I don't know. Some guy I didn't like. Um, <laughs> but so James was the company executive officer when I was a it was some teddy bear, some teddy bear with a Union Jack on, <laughs> I think. Yeah. But I remember I wrote uh, the first draft of my platoon sergeant's uh, evaluation report, as NCOER as we call it. And he wrote, he came back and go, sir, what is this? Are you trying to ruin my career? I was like, well, I mean, we did lose that one item, so it wasn't 100%. He said, like, come on. I was like, well, I'm not going to lie about it. I'll just promote another bullet or something, you know, find those right words so we don't destroy you, brother. <laughs> so. No, it, it is. Reports can, can be your death knell or the making of them, you know, um, promoted immediately, promoted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Into course, promoted in his turn. All these little little lines, they yeah. mean so much. Like I remember uh, reading one of James's re, uh, evaluation reports and it said, of all the officers I have, James is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> or was the other one, I would not breed from this officer. <laughs> or or, or written, written on a female officer, I know him well by the senior officer. You know, I know him well. <laughs> Well, that's the, you know, a lot of times with those reports, a lot of individuals don't really put any time or effort into it. And no. it's cut and paste. No. So they're cutting and pasting exactly what they had on the uh, last 10 reports. And yeah. uh, that's a, it's a shame because words do matter. And oh. especially in that situation. So, but you know, everything happens for a reason. I'm sure that, well, I know yeah. you've, what you've been able to do, uh, you know, because those things might not happen if that individual didn't put that bad report together for you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. I mean, I, I'm really grateful. Um, I learned so much. I mean, a couple of role models like um, where have we got uh, General the Lord Dannett. Here we are. Uh, uh, Richard Dannett leading from the front. Yeah. Who was, he became the head of the army as well. He was my boss when I was he was my colonel when I was a major. And he gave me the chance that I think I was, I was like age 28. He made me an acting major uh, and, and gave me the air mobile screen company. We had light strike vehicles. We had June buggies with mortars in. We had rocket launchers. It was the best stuff ever. In by helicopter Chinooks and we drove out. It was just such cool stuff. Yeah. And uh, I wrote about all my my uh, my fuck ups and blunders in this book, <laughs> <laughs> inspiring leadership. <laughs> how how not to lead. But no, the, the people I learned from and um, uh, Richard was one of those. Um, and there were some really good leaders that I worked for, and some fearsome ones who uh, scared the crap out of me. And um, sometimes sort of bullied people as their way getting forward. But but most of them, uh, there's some really fine leaders who you just don't find in business leaders of that quality. Or yeah. luckily they leave business and they do, so they leave the military and they go into business and they do incredibly well. So people listening, if you're in the military and you're thinking of coming out, you've got great qualities which people need and you just need to translate them in a way that people understand yeah. what you bring. But I would always you know, meet new guys. It's like, like meeting two friends. We, we just understand what we've been through. And if you've been through any selection, like airborne selection or whatever, and passed it, or even if you haven't passed it, it's still something which will transform your life. And, right. and I, I remember the, uh, the corporal, um, the officers always had to sort of encourage the men and you're running along doing the training on some long death valley and up and down the hills. And they'd just taken us to the front gate after the 10 miler. And they went, Right, we're not going in after all. Close the barrier. We're going to go out and do it again. Oh, and everybody like starts giving up and, and getting off. But of course, that was what they were waiting for. Get on the jack wagon, you're, you're out. And then I was sort of struggling on keeping going. And they went, right, you, carry his pack. I go, but Corporal, I've got a pack. Don't argue with me. Give me 20. I was like, pretty present. Now carry his pack. So I put my arms through his pack. And this little private soldier was off like a jackrabbit. This is great. No pack. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm going like this, walking along, getting slow. He goes, you're a loser. Just give up. You know, you're never going to make it. Thank you, Corporal. I just walk it along. Oh, fuck it. Come back here. Carry your pack again and off you go. <laughs> anyway, no, but fruity, fruity, fruity language. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, but it's, it is, it's so true with the, um, with the mental game. I was just talking to James uh, yesterday. Um, when we were training for best ranger um i tried out in hawaii and it's i think it was december and it's like two in the morning and you show up and it's you're in the kahukus which is just up and down in hawaii and we show up 
and they basically line us up and they say, okay, go. You'll know when to stop whenever it is. And it's, it's dark and you're just going. And because you don't have, you're not allowed to have a watch or anything on you. You're just going, you know, no iPod. You're just, it's just you with your own breath. Uh, because wow. quickly 12 people, because that's about as many weirdos try to try out for best ranger competition. <laughs> you know, um, we just separated. And so you're just alone. Your thoughts just running and just going, okay, eventually I, someone's going to show up, which happens. They just show up and they go, okay, stop. Come on. Go grab some water. Go get in the wood line. But you, you don't know. Wow. So. wow. <laughs> it's Those are the worst yeah. situations when you don't know what, to, what you're getting into. Those are the worst. They mess Correct. with your mind big time. Yes. And I, I think that sounds really awesome. And I, I think of occasion when they try and break you by, you know, battle isn't fair. The other side don't go, oh, do you know what, James, you look a bit tired. Take a break. You know, well, I tell you what, it, it's like it's half past five. Let's have some afternoon tea. You know, <laughs> English, you know, have the afternoon tea. Stop. But, they, you know, so we were out on one run on the airborne training. We were running up this hill. We got to the top and we were really hungry. We hadn't had breakfast. And they'd laid out chefs with white tablecloths and they had their, their white hats on and all mm. their whites. There was baked beans and sausage and scramble eggs. It looked lovely. And the sergeant ran up to him went, no. Poof. And he kicked all the lot. He kicked it all over. He went, you lot don't deserve breakfast. Keep running. What? And about five of them gave up at that stage. They just were so looking forward to breakfast. And he yeah. goes, the enemy don't let you have breakfast. I'm not going to let you have breakfast. Keep running. No, absolutely. It's, it is the mental game. And I think you can carry that into business. We talk about that a lot yeah. uh, about, you know, especially you, you did a double marathon. Um, yeah. I try to, I, I do Ironmans. Well, I haven't done one in a couple of years now, but I trained for Ironmans, which is 140.6 miles, 2.4 wow. mile, 112 mile bike, 26.2 mile run for those that aren't familiar. And it's, it's the continuation of that. You know, I purposely try to put myself and, and a lot of people like us trying to keep fit, put ourselves in a pain cave where we go into it and then you emerge. And that's how you can maintain that mental resiliency to say, I can go to a dark place, but there I can always find a way to get out. That was something we talked about. Yeah. Uh, the episode I was with you of, you know, well, how would you have found a way out of that or solve that problem? That's something I was brilliant. I was using that with my daughter just the other day. That's, that's mm -hmm. really good. And, and I think also the experiences you guys have had and all the others who've, who've listened in, on the occasion in business when people get all really excited, I say, let's keep this in perspective. Has anybody died? Right. right. So, so why are we getting wrapped around the axle of this, this problem? What's the, what's the issue? Let's have a solution. Just think about it, learn from it, and act on it. Right. Maybe, okay. No, that's, and that's huge. I mean, even when we were in combat and deployed, you know, if something happened, we're like, okay, well, yeah, we got shot at, or we may have gotten, you know, hit with an IED, but if nobody died, we can still limp our vehicles home. Okay, not all is lost. You got to find the, find the good stuff and then just practice that every single day of your life, even out of the, uh, once you leave the service, you know, yeah. and I think that's where, I think to your point, that's where, um, as military, we can come together and form these, this, these bonds like brothers and sisters, because we've shared these experiences and it's like, no, I understand. I understand the suck factor as we call yeah. it, you know? Yeah. And I think you, you, you raised a good point there, Martin James. And I think we have to remember when we go from the military into business, people don't understand all our nomenclature, all our three letter, four letter abbreviations, <laughs> right. uh, certain cries, certain mantras that we have. And, and if we're not emotionally intelligent enough, and that's a great skill I think we all have to learn on leaving the military to be more emotionally intelligent, to manage our emotions well. If friends of mine who've had PTSD or been through bad things can lose it completely, uh, you, you've probably lost it in the job. So, so you need to manage your emotions, can't control them, manage your emotions well, but read other people, really mm -hmm. read them. And I think good, you know, NCOs and good officers, good other ranks can read others well, but it's a real skill for business and cultural differences and perceptions of how they see you. Uh, for a long time, when I first came out, I didn't keep saying when I was in the military, this, when I was in the army, that they call them when I, or when we, when I was here, <laughs> yeah. when I did uh, just like the other American abbreviations, a Paduma. Do you remember a Paduma? 
pulled directly out of my ass. Is it, is it like <laughs> nice. Or, or wagai. I've got a wagai. The general's got yeah. a wagai. What's a wagai? Yeah. Wouldn't it be a good idea if yeah. no, no, it wouldn't be a good idea. Let's not do that. Yeah, it's not <laughs> a good idea, Ferry. Yeah. yeah that's, that's right. um, now, I'm writing that one down. I'm going to use that on Marty Paduma. later. Uh, Paduma. Yeah, Paduma. Paduma. No, and I think I think that's huge. And, and so um, one of the things that I learned as I, I mean, I really didn't learn it. I think I'm, I probably learned it when I was enlisted going through the expert infantryman badge training. But I really hit home as a second lieutenant going through the infantry officer basic course. It was a basic class on communications and how to run a radio. And the instructor, uh, Anitio, it was a uh, sergeant first class. He goes, listen up, gentlemen. When you grab the hand mic, I want you to think, push, talk. You know, talk about the hand mic. And I was like, why is he being so deliberate? And then it's, but it's something I care about. Think what you're going to say before you squeeze it and just come off like a buffoon. Yeah. And, uh, and so the same thing in business, take that little lesson on a, how to run a, a radio and before you send something or say something, think, push, talk, squeeze the that hand. Is, and talk. That is so good. Well, mm -hmm. I think you just reminded me of one brief story, and I'm sure we, we're going to run out of time soon. But um, I, I went as, a, as a, a young lad to do the commando course with the Royal Engineers at, at a citadel in, in the south of England. It was a really cool thing. And they were constantly playing with our heads. We were young lads thinking about joining the army. And they took us to the, uh, the edge of the castle walls and all the tourists below watching us. And he goes, right, we're going to do some forward abseiling. He said, um, so uh, let's get ready. And then he goes, hey, uh, Mick, this rope, uh, it's a bit frayed. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to break. No, it's all right. It'll do it for, it's just kids. It, okay, um, who's first? <laughs> no more wanting to go. He was playing with us, of course. We didn't know that. Right. So, of course, and he grabs me and I'm on there and then my knees are knocking and I'm trying to lean forward and that kind of stuff. And they're at the bottom going, aren't they brave? I go, no, I'm not fucking brave. I'm just <laughs> And anyway, we did it. Then, you know, you jump and let some out. And you think, this is so cool. I want to do it again. And, and then he took us around and they had the... Um, they had the water, you know, with the tunnel, you get pushed mm -hmm. down by somebody and then mm -hmm. someone drags you out and then you push them down. So he goes to it. And actually, the ice, if you're thinking back to it, the ice was only just melting away. And he goes, oh, it's a bit warm, Mick. He said, did you leave the thermostat on? Well, sorry about that. Yeah, I did. It's too hot. They might they might get scalded in there. I don't worry about it. Look, it's a bit hot when you get in there, but don't worry about that. Just be quick through the tunnel. So I go running along, really gullible. And I jump in and go, it's really hot. And I remember thinking, as my head was being shoved under the tunnel, ha, huh, this is really cold. But my, I, was, I was trying to think, it's hot, it's hot, it's hot. It's amazing how stupid you are. <laughs> so he hauled me out. And then he'd explain to another lad, when you go into the tunnel in the dark, he said, just reach up and there's a little light switch. You can pull it on and it lights all the way along. You can see where you're going. <laughs> and so I'm following this guy and we're crawling along. The guy ahead of me is pulling at the grass on the side of the way. What are you doing? Oh, Sergeant, I'm looking for the light switch. There's no <laughs> light switch, you idiot. Just get on. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but they they love just playing with us, don't they? They just so love. Oh, man. It's, it's a whole field. There could be a book in itself of yeah. NCOs and their funny stories and idiots. They, they you know, jokes oh, they tell people. Absolutely. And humility. They have the psychological high ground there. It's not fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they do. They do. They really do. Yeah, we had... Um... I was a private when I was enlisted and the, our radios were called, uh, you know, prick 77s, personal <laughs> radios. And so they sent me down to the combo shed and I come down going, I'm looking for a pricky six. And go, well, you found <laughs> one. Like, oh, it just kind of hit me. Or a long wait. You get sent for a long wait. <laughs> yeah. but, but thinking about blunders we make, when I was the assistant to the head of the army, your life expectancy is like a first world war officer you're not going to last long my two predecessors have both been fired and left the army they've been kicked out of the army so it's like <laughs> great job you're the adc to the head of the army but you could lose your job and uh anyway there were a couple of occasions when i almost blew it but the most famous one i do remember was this general was fearsome he's in the house of lords now uh, quite old and he's not very well now but a field marshal of the Lord Inge, but he was so scary. He would like shout at people. They hadn't saluted him from a mile away and this kind of stuff. And people were just in fear of him. It's called being, he was called Sir Peter Inge. It's called being syringed by him. <laughs> because, because he took... Anyway, uh, so I went to work for this guy and he, he, clearly he was not frightened of anybody, but there was one person he was frightened of. And that was the guy he'd been ADC to, General Sir Desmond Gordon. 
And he said to me, look, if General Sir Desmond Gordon rings, whatever he wants to do, meet me, if he wants me to meet at the club or whatever it is, I must go. It's got to be, you know, I've really got to be there for him. Right, sir. Okay. So taking all these calls at the desk. And one day I get this call. Hello. I go, hello, sir. He goes, General Sir Desmond Gordon here. I go, oh, right, sir. Oh, this is really important. This is the really important. Lunch, the club, Thursday. Uh, for, 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 for the general, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, oh, well, actually, um, he's seeing the prime minister, sir, uh, 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 Margaret Thatcher. Oh, all right. OK. What about you, then? Um, me, sir? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, you. <laughs> you come and have lunch. <laughs> oh, all right. Thank you, sir. That'd be very kind. <laughs> anyway, you can see what happened. The day comes. I'm, I'm sorting out sandwiches for the general or something, because I don't have a life. It's just his life. I don't have a life. And then Colonel Nigel Hall comes in. He goes, Jonathan, where should you be? And I went, hey, um, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I should be having lunch in the club with General Sir Desmond. Oh, oh I am geez. toast. He said, you're, you're in trouble. He said, oh, oh, oh. You know, he thought I was you. And it left me to it. You know? So, oh, my God, what do I do? Can I, can I have a heart attack? Can I, can I have a hurricane hit the building? I mean, something's got to happen. Please, God, take me away. That cold sweat that runs down the back of your shirt. No. What do I do? So I thought, I'll ring. So I rang his home. In those days, he didn't have mobiles. And this voice says, hello, Lady Langley here. And I go, uh, hello, um, it's Jonathan. And I, I was meant to have lunch with General Desmond. I forgot to. And she went, who, my dear? You are in trouble. Oh, no. <laughs> so I wrote a letter of apology and, you know, just completely forgot that kind of stuff. And then I thought, I've got to tell the boss oh, and he's not going to be happy. So what do I do? So I take him some business cards. We're on the eighth iteration of these business cards. I bring them in and I go, uh, and, the, and the, it's this like a tennis court. It's massive, his room. I go, stand there by the door. Yes, what is it? I go, I've got your business cards for you, General. Oh, good, good. Bring them over. So I bring them over and give it to him. Oh, actually, these ones, the eighth iteration, these aren't bad. They're good. Good gold. You know, I like the gold print and the right. Just exactly right. So I stand there. Like, what, what are you standing there for? Uh, there's, there's, I've made a mistake, sir. Well, it can't be that important. What do you do? OK, here goes. I forgot to have lunch with Gerald Sir Desmond Gordon. Oh, my God. <laughs> God <laughs> no, no, he never does that. So he said, you must ring him. I've rung him, sir. You must write to him. I've written to him. Just go away, which wasn't, you're fired, which is normally <laughs> yours. He was like, just get out my sight. And so I just sculpted around, trying to avoid him for a week. And I hadn't got fired. And then I got this call. Hello? I go, Hello? <laughs> General Sir Desmond Gordon here? I go, oh, no. Go, oh, God. Hello, sir. <laughs> Lunch, the club, on Wednesday. I go, for the general, sir? No, for you. <laughs> I won't forget. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and you know what? He was the loveliest guy I have ever met. He was charming. He was like an uncle. And, and, and he said, you've learned a lesson. You'll never forget that. And I haven't. I really haven't. <laughs> so many lessons. Sorry, long story. Long no, story. It's, oh, it's, that's awesome. That, <laughs> I get lost in, in the stories, you know, it's sitting here and I could, I could sit here and you could tell these all day. These are amazing. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, my God. Can you tell us about this moment? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, Liz, uh, Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth <laughs> I. Um, and have you noticed she, she's, she has this way of shaking your hand and she's just gently pushing me away, which is like, go away. <laughs> but no, she, she, she shakes your hand and, and then she talks to you. But it, this is about presence. She and Princess Diana, who I was also lucky enough to meet on another occasion, are the two people who've left me with an indelible memory of just how powerful they are. Colin Powell was the same. You, you meet him, Richard Dannett was the same. You meet them and you never forget them. And you're the only person in the room. It feels like you're the only person in the room meeting them. And, and she had no earpiece, no sort of special agent earpiece briefing her. She knew about the fact that I was, this, my, my, I was just finishing, I helped with East Timor massacre. We worked with the American forces and the Australians and the New Zealanders and the French Canadians to prepare the Australians for the UN operations in East Timor. And I was the chief of staff of the brigade that did that. And, and I got my MBE for that and for, for running the brigade headquarters for about three years. But, but she knew all about me and she knew I was going on to PricewaterhouseCoopers as a consultant. Just so special. It was a, a moment I will remember all my life. And she has presence, real presence. That is amazing. 
Yeah, yeah, we, we all have individuals that we've met that just you can feel their presence hit you in the face. Mm. And that's that's rare. I mean, but you can feel it and sense it. Yeah. And then I could see it when you just we pop the picture up there. I could see it in your eyes. You, I mean, you're immediately back at that place. So yeah. I, I yeah. appreciate you sharing yeah. that because we were asking about that quite about the yeah. picture. Yeah. Yeah. Great picture. Thanks. So let's do it. We're running out of time, but I'm going to I'm going to run a quick commercial. And then when we come back from the commercial, I want to talk about how you transitioned or as we always talk about the transformation from the military to what you're doing now. So this is going to be a quick commercial break and we will be right back. OK. perfect book for a veteran you know especially if they've been struggling with transition or trying to find their place or they haven't found that stride wearing that new outfit, he was like a million dollars. Giving back is key for me, quite frankly. Um, we did an event uh, called Suiting Our Heroes, where we invited everybody to come in and basically donate their gently used suit. Because there's a lot of veterans out there, to be quite frank, that can't even, even afford a suit. So what we did was we had the community get involved, giving food, giving some soft drinks, and basically come out and donate your gently used suit. What we did with those suits is we went ahead and gave them to um, veterans that couldn't afford any clean because they're gently used. We had them tailored. We donated a shirt and tie to go with that. And guess what? When you see a veteran wearing that new outfit, he was like a million dollars. And he knows he can go out there for the next chapter of his life and feel confident about that. You're watching the Lounge with Legends TV show with your hosts, Marty Martinez and James A. Phelps. Right. Guys, I, I'm really pumped up by that. Firstly, I love the one about the suits, but also Stephen uh, and Lane have persuaded me to go with them to uh, Machu Picchu in May. And I'm hoping you two guys are going to join us. I've got yeah. a couple of friends as well from the UK who I hope are going to come. Uh, it's it's an awesome thing. And I love their book, uh, Unleash yeah. Your Humble Alpha. I, I listened to it twice. And those two have become really good friends to me. And I have greatest respect for Great both, both of them and I had them on my podcast. And they're, they're really interesting guys. So people read that book. It's a great yeah. book. It's absolutely Typically, great. that's when Marty brings out his signed hard copy edition because i don't have an autographed version yet i'm a, i'm working on it i'm working yet. on it You're, yet yet he's going to get it in houston because we'll be at the have event in houston uh november uh 6th 7th and 8th so yeah. it's not too late okay. everybody else can get the book sign up and i'm sure Stephen and lane will sign it for you that, yeah. that will be a great event even though i can't be there in person i hope i can somehow if it's possible to join by video for some of that that'll be lovely oh, i'm sure it'll be amazing and then of course we ran a rod salute to suits our our show sponsor and we, if you're interested in um, entering our drawing for the uh, our free suit giveaway for Veterans Day or Armistice Day, uh, as it's known elsewhere, um, it's DM us the word um, suit and then a, a brief uh, explanation as to why, as a transitioning veteran, you want this uh, transition package, which is one suit, two shirts, two ties, and two pocket squares. So. Mm. Thanks right. to our sponsors. Um, so again, we, Jonathan, back to you. We had just walked through your amazing career. It was almost not as an insult, but almost like a Forrest Gump kind of thing where you've gone through this. I'm amazing. Forrest Gump. Yeah, I'm Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> run, so, Forrest, run! <laughs> so cool. But, and so now you're, um, 
now you're outside. We only have a, a few minutes left. Uh, let's let's talk about what you're doing now with you know all the amazing things that you're doing, sir. Yeah, very briefly. So I'm a broadcaster, um, which I, I love. Uh, as someone who's dyslexic, my way is, is video and uh, and podcasts. It's got in the top one and a half percent of uh, podcasts in the world, which is good. Just gone up from two percent to one. Oh, it's top one percent actually. I've just been told it's gone again uh, up. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, and, and I really call myself the CEO's trusted leadership advisor. So I, I work as a leadership coach to CEOs, boards and top teams. My wife does too. So we, we do a double act of sort of systemic team coaches in big corporate organizations, a place like Seattle, uh, and different parts of New York and America and different parts of America, and also in the UK and around the world. We also set up a charity for vulnerable girls called the Inspiring Leadership Trust, which was my wife's initiative. Uh, and when she wrote her book, um, which uh, her one, Inspiring Women Leaders, which uh, the girls out there, as well as the men, would enjoy reading the research that she's done. Uh, that was that was me in my early days, uh, just after the Falklands War. Not quite sure you can see me just yeah. get onto one of the landing craft because I served with the Scots Guards. I didn't mention that one, but the Scots Guards um, had been to the Falklands War. And so I was lucky to have a platoon who'd served in war when I was just a, a 20 year old. And that was a real education. But, um, oh, yeah, that's a picture. Oh, God, that's a picture of me, yes, with Colour Sergeant Haig. That's right. Gosh, going onto the boat. In those days, we had that self-loading rifle and those, those awful rucksacks. But, yeah, that was the days. That was a lot of fun. But, um, yeah, team coach now and, and motivational speaking. I'm always delighted to, to speak to groups over the Internet as well as in person around the world. And I just love the work I do. It's a real, it's a real vocation. It's a real calling. That's yeah. definitely the case. Now you, you have a passion and, and, and the, um, your podcast is absolutely amazing. I love oh, yeah. the questions. I mean, you, you, uh, you definitely made me think about the answers. I, I struggle to answer these. No, you were insp inspirational, Marty. You're, you're very <laughs> modest, but you came across great. I'm looking forward to James being on. I'm nervous. I, I you know, as soon as he uh, was off the, you know, after you guys recorded the show, he called me, said, you're in trouble. I said, no. <laughs> but he, I told him, I said, it's amazing. Cause you know, you had so many episodes and you know, I was going to ask you, you know, I, I was looking at uh, episode 147 where you did a review of all 147 um, episodes that you had before. I actually, I love following it because you always give a top tip yeah. and you always, that's, I honestly, you know, sometimes I don't have enough time to listen to the whole show, but I always go in and look at the little box of golden nugget, you know, the yeah. top tip that you give, but no, this particular kind of one, yeah. you know, you always leave with value. And that's what I really, what gravitates me towards you and what gravitated me towards you after, you know, Stephen introduced us. You know, because yeah, you. even on that tip there on the um, episode uh, 148, you said, you know, your top tip was send the lift back down to let others get the, you know, get to the top like you have been so yeah. you can help them do so. Right. So basically, yeah. basically you're saying, hey, look, I've already got this experience and, you know, I, I can help you so you don't make the same mistakes that I did. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that's that why I think is inspiring, man. That's that. Well, I love that. that. Uh, James, you're very kind. And if they go onto my website, jonathanperks.com, you can, if you're short of time, just listen to the two minute top tips. We have General Sir Mike Jackson, uh, who was the, the airborne guy, um, a, a real tough soldier and um, uh, caught up in Northern Ireland as well and all went on. But, but the, you know, everybody you meet has something to teach you. And I find these little top tips uh, are very helpful. And that's why we did a little, where are we? Uh, little pocket version. You can get them on Amazon. Uh, top tips for inspired leaders. It's just a little pocketbook. But um, helping guys who've been in the military succeed in business. The best guys in the military will do very well in business. And everybody has a, everybody has a role, something for them. You've just got to believe in yourself and have people who will help you. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing to help others uh, make that transition. Because it is a bit of a culture shock. But don't underestimate what you're capable of. I was told, oh, you, you're going to have to go out and be on far less money. And I go, really? And, oh, yeah, probably half what you're on before. What? Well, actually, I went out and I was on about 50% rise on what I had. And so don't believe it. But I found a very good transition was going into PricewaterhouseCoopers as a consultant. That was my first step using my MBA. Then IBM Business Consulting. Then I became an MD of a, of a, of a PLC. And now for the last 10 years, I've been a director of my own business as an entrepreneur um, because one of my clients, uh, Deanna Oppenheimer, who is an American CEO, she said, Jonathan, they're not buying your firm. They're buying you. Mm -hmm. So so set up on your own. 
I thought, oh, no, right. I can't do it on my own. I've always been in an organization. But actually, that was great advice uh, going on my own. But but having learned from other people's mistakes at, at their expense and being paid a salary. So I would encourage you to to learn from others first before you sort of start going out on your own. I uh, love it. I mean, you inspire so many others just by, you know, what you do, just being you, just inspiring others. And then it's so obvious, you know, just even with your values, the hit values that you have, you know, those kind of things are very powerful. I'm going to get a copy. I don't have that top tip, uh, top tip book, but I'm going okay. to get that off of Amazon. I am. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite an know. easy one. Yeah, it's an, yeah. It's an easy one. I always like to get that because what happens, we talked about it earlier, you know, we're all going to go into a dark place at some times. But, you know, the darkness is always followed by the light. So that's sometimes true. that's why I want to have that book. So when it's I'm in good. a dark place, I can be that light switch for me. And that's why I like your top tips. So. Yeah. I, and I, I think it's uh, please use the resources of the website. They're all there. And there's book reviews as well. Good books that people might enjoy reading. But I did really enjoy Unleash Your Humble Alpha. And, and it resonated that the value system. And I think a, a key thing for us in the military is that we're often taught to be so super strong and dead hard, stand mm -hmm. your ground. Okay. And then you've got to go into business and it's okay sometimes to be vulnerable and you go, so what do we do, boss? What do we do? And you go, I don't know. What do you think we should do? Just let's just hear some of your views. Okay. Okay. I like that one. Okay. I like that one. A bit of that one. This is what we're going to do. Follow me. And, uh, but you don't have to command and control like we used to do in the military and that sort of airborne initiative that you all saw and I experienced where they go, so what? Y you were dropped off in a helicopter in South Amar in bandit country with a terrorist. And there was you as a major with a corporal and two private soldiers. And, and you, afterwards, you had an after action review where you all shared what you got wrong and what you could do better. Did, but, but you're the major. I said, no, no, this is what happens in good teams. You're prepared to learn teachable moments. What I get mm -hmm. wrong, what I intend to get right next time. So that there's that respect that you earn. And, and that respect, you don't often find that in some companies. There's some pretty flaky companies out there with some really poor managers. So they need your military skills. They desperately need your military skills. Uh, absolutely. That's, uh, and that's something we talk about all the time is um, don't jettison your military skill sets. Focus it so that you can transition and transform to business success. You know, and finding that balance. Yes, there are some things I need to get rid of. Maybe I don't need to curse as much and use knife hands. Um, but uh, there is things like project management and understanding how information flows, how to lead, how to manage, things like that. But you're just adapting it, adapt and overcoming to the new environment. Yeah, yeah. very much so. There's lots and of and I, love, I love what you're talking about with the teams because it kind of reminds me, again, we talked about team of teams. Um, yes, I love that. And McChrystal. Um, he'll be on in two weeks. Next week, we have Matt Eversman from Black Hawk Down, and then and then we've got General McChrystal coming on the week after. That's cool. Those are going to be good. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. We, might have to ping, uh, we might have to ping uh, Jonathan in as a guest, like, pop in <laughs> for that episode. Yeah, that's uh, we'll so be, cool. I'm that's sure so we'll cool. be talking about Team of Teams and Risk with General McChrystal. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, before yeah. we run out of time, I want to ask you um, the question. The question. Um, the question of uh, freedom. So you've served and you've sacrificed and you've given up a lot uh, for for our freedoms uh, between our nations and, and, and the many nations out there. So uh, freedom means something a little bit different for us, those who have served and been deployed. We ask you, Jonathan, um, what does freedom mean to you? Yeah, that's a really great question. For me, freedom means serve to lead. And, and serve to lead is the motto that we had as, as young officer cadets and when I was back as an instructor at the Royal Military Academy Santos in England, that you are prepared to serve the soldiers that you lead. Officers eat last and that kind of mm -hmm. motto where you make sure your men are there. But also you're prepared, like my father did, to give your life for your colleagues and for your country. And so for me, freedom also means being prepared to, to sacrifice for others. And it also means it's about family. And it's about, for me, my father and my mother. And my, my father was a hero, gave his life for his country and his colleagues. And my mother who supported him and followed the flag. That's what freedom means to me. Wow, I love it. That is, that is awesome. Um, God, I love these answers. It was, we created the freedom means just for something to tie everything together. And it's just taken on a life of its own because everyone it has, has a unique perspective. Very powerful. 
Very powerful. I absolutely love it because it, uh, and I love your answer, sir. It is absolutely. Um, wow. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> that's that's the first on his birthday. <laughs> on his birthday. <laughs> I got down. But guys, um, I just really loved your, your show here. I think it's awesome what you're doing and the support and the intent behind it. Um, I, I think a lot of people are going to take a lot of inspiration from you. And I wish them every success in, in the step, the transition that they make from their life serving and uh, giving up so much for their country and their colleagues to then go in where it's actually less about the team and more about the individual. But mm. you don't lose that selflessness and that being a bit streetwise, so you don't get worked over, um, and, and you realize the value that you bring with a humility and a humanity and a bit of humor. Humility, humanity, and humor. What? They're always quite important. I like yeah, that. absolutely. Man, that's awesome. Uh, I don't want this episode to end. It's such a great episode. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right, sir. Well, I thank you for being our guest this week, for being our legend, and having such a great story. Um, and... Sir, we thank you for your service. Well, I, and thank you guys for all you're doing. And good luck with all those who are listening and watching. Thank you, sir. We're going to put you in the green room and we'll follow up with you right after we end the show today. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks, sir. Wow, James. Wow. Um, I, I found myself just sitting back. And I mean, I, it's kind of like um, I could just watch TV all day. So I could, I was just in the middle. I, I forget, I, I forget I'm running the show uh, with you here. <laughs> Someone's got to click on something. I was, but... I was supposed to be asking questions. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so talk about next week's going to be epic too. I was going to say talk about next week. Yeah, next week uh, one of uh, one of our heroes, one of our legends here locally in the um, in in your community, right? Uh, but Matt Eversman, uh, everyone you know that's. I, I mean, I don't know anybody that doesn't know who he is, but um, if you don't <laughs> get the book. Read the book, watch the movie, Black Hawk Down. Um, yeah, I mean, there's got, so many powerful things coming. We've got some then, great events coming up. We've got, uh, I'm looking at the schedule over here, so that's what I'm looking off camera. We've got Matt Eversman, the one with the Mogadishu Ranger. We've got uh, General McChrystal after that, the one with the team of teams leader. We've got the one with the Ranger Chaplain, which will be uh, Stephen Barry, Ranger Hall of Famer, just inducted for 2020 uh, when I was down in Fort Benning. And then after that, we've got... Uh, the one with the Texas coffee guru, JR. I know, it's been amazing. So we're going, we're going there. And then we've got a uh, one with Ranger Horrors, uh, Olin Lester, another Ranger. So we got a great lineup coming. So I'm looking forward to it. Well, we're, I think we're bringing in Jose, you know, go Army, beat Navy. But we got that Navy sprinkled in there with us. <laughs> you know, we, got, we got to take a break from the Rangers. But uh, <laughs> all right. So. We um, thank you for all the birthday wishes that were coming in. I'm sorry I couldn't show them all, but Jonathan was on a roll and I didn't want to distract him. So thank you for all the comments and the, and the blessings and uh, be legendary. You've been watching the Lounge with Legend Show on E360 TV, countering the narrative that veterans are all broken misfit toys. Veterans are the lifeblood of American freedom, serving in harsh situations, coupled with their training, have forged them into some of the most resilient and capable leaders in the world. And that's where we come in, celebrating the success stories, taking you on a journey of transformation from military to business. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we'll be back soon. But find us on Facebook at Lounge with Legend or at JTF214. Till next time.